Expeditions podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the In Expeditions podcast. My name, of course, is Aaron Harvey. Uh, this is season two, episode eight. And on today's show, I brought in a special friend, uh, an incredibly inspiring guy named Andrew Strunk, who is a firefighter in Perth. Um, he's travelled extensively, incredibly fit guy, has done marathons in the polar ice regions, which we'll talk about in the show. Can't wait for you to hear about that. Uh, and on top of all of these things, Andrew also is a personal trainer and fitness instructor at a place called the G- the Mill Gym in Fremantle, which is a veteran-owned and run gym at a kind of high-level performance um, gym in Fremantle. So, But on top of all of that, he also uh, volunteers his time amongst his busy lifestyle of travel and seeing all his friends and a great social life. He also uh, volunteers for a organization called the Backpacker Medics. Now, they operate in areas when they can obviously at the moment with COVID they're not doing it but when they can they go and help uh, disaster stricken areas and they basically the idea for these guys is to get medical um, help to areas that that can't get it and they with their backpacks and remote area access through a team of experts and qualified usually military background sort of people can get medical help to more remote areas that need it. Um, like I say, most of the time they might even just have their backpacks on and they're hiking up into the mountains and the jungles of areas to give people help outside of the epicenters of the cities and places like that. So incredible episode coming up. Um, on the backside of everything that Andrew does, um, work-wise, travel, backpack and medic stuff where he volunteers all of his own time, um, he needs downtime. So we dig into that as well, which is super interesting. It's really great to listen to Andrew's uh, daily routine on how he manages to give himself rest and recovery amongst training, work, travel, and then the help with his organization. So it's a super interesting episode to listen to as to how he goes about all of that and giving himself that time to maintain um, and, and stay at an optimal level, I guess, which a major part of that is rest and relaxation meditation and keeping yourself physically and mentally um, able to do all of these things so can't wait for you guys to hear it let's have a listen right now and um, check it out all right so we're here with strunk today andrew strunk's joining me thankfully someone we've got in the studio with this year, I think a lot of my guests have been on on the airwaves, but I'm so grateful that Andrew has been able to visit and he's joining me today on the show, man. Yeah, Thanks mate. for coming in. Oh, stoked to be next mouth. You could be catching up with everyone and yeah, much better doing this face to face than over the phone. Yeah, it is good um, because, you know, we've been friends for a few years now and it's hard talking to friends over the airwaves. I think we, we sort of tried this a few months ago over the computer when you were down in Perth and it just wasn't quite the same and you had some house renovations going yeah. on and it was just yeah not ideal but I'm, I'm so much um, happier that I can get you in and talk to you face to face. Definitely mate, yeah. It's pretty rad. So um, the reasons you are here, you're obviously on a bit of a holiday at the moment, you're travelling your way down the coast, how's that been? Oh, it's been awesome. We, after last year, uh, everyone, you know, thought 2020 was a big year. Obviously, we had the COVID pandemic and everyone thought, well, 2020 is done. 2021 is going to be nice and chill. Uh, and then unfortunately for, for me and for work, it hasn't been chill at all. So the first five months have pretty much been go, go, go. Um, so I finally got a, a bit of holidays and I'm just uh, spending four weeks up and down the beautiful West Australian coast, uh, which is the perfect perfect way to wind down. It totally is, and I've noticed that we're getting a lot more people come and see WA that normally wouldn't, partly because the people that I've been speaking to when I've been out camping and stuff, a lot of people go overseas for their holidays, and you know, a lot of people will go overseas for three or four months at a time, so they're just trying something new, and a lot of people never been to West Australia are coming and, um, and noticing it. It's like WA is getting more and more on the map. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Well, I was, I was an East Coaster that moved over here. And from the first time I set foot in WA, I was like, that's that's me. I will move there for good and I'll stay there. And I did it and friends of mine that can visit me have stayed for good. And yeah, I think it's it's hard to come over here. And if you do want that 
you know, wide open space and unbelievable natural beauty um, with just less people than the East Coast. It's just a completely different way of life over here that I fully bought into. Well, I think the secret's kind of out because from what I'm hearing is that everyone, you know, WA used to have a rap years ago when we travelled around when I was on the East Coast, everyone was kind of, you know, WA's like old, like it's like 20 years in the past. Like we're so far behind with everything. But now it seems that everyone's like, well, that's, like we kind of like that. It's like the final frontier and people are catching wind that there's, you know, these open spaces and um, space to go and do your thing and, and it's not too terribly overly populated. So yeah, I think a it. lot of people are aware of that now and that's what some people are going for now. I think it's changed uh, like for a good way, you know, in the, in the city itself because when I first moved here, Perth, like outside of, you know, business hours, Monday to Friday, nine to five, the CBD was a ghost town and yeah. it didn't really have a lot to offer um, and, it's actually turned into quite a cool city. I remember people like you move over here and they'd whinge about, you know, I've got, there's nothing to do. I can't keep up with all the things there is to do. <laughs> I yeah. feel like I'm missing yeah. out half the time. So, <laughs> uh, and then where I live in Frio, I just absolutely love like it's, you know, you've got all that old beautiful architecture, incredible yeah. beaches. Um, there's so much happening just in my neck of the woods, especially sometimes I, I hardly leave Frio to head into the city. Yeah. Um, if it wasn't for working in the city, I, I probably wouldn't. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot to do around if you're willing to go a bit adventurous and, and, and open your mind up to, to doing other things, yeah. which is, I guess, in a way what's so special about going remote you know, in WA. And you, if you can make your own fun, there's just so That's much it. to do. And you can still find a beach to yourself somewhere in the WA coastline, um, yeah. which is every time I do, I, I just think to myself, like, I don't know how many spots left on the East Coast to like this. Um, you know, there's stretches of Western SA, which I think is similar, but yeah. WA, you know, you've got so much coastline and so few people. Um, yeah, it's bountiful. It sure is. Um, yeah, we're, we're definitely settled here for, for a good amount of time now. Uh, well, because I think part of it with you and what you do is, I mean, you're a firefighter in Perth. I mean, that that's, like you say, that's just such a busy, demanding thing to do so you finally got a chance to get away because yeah i mean you're an extensive traveler i mean i've known you for for probably over 10 or 12 years now and i've just always remembered you being the guy that just gets out and travels and just lives man it's it's epic to see and it's infectious when you're around you you know but you're incredibly fit guy as well which you know i don't know if that kind of goes hand in hand or it's just how you feel or you just yeah just want to roam yeah that's that's a hard one i think the roaming or the traveling my parents were were travelers you know told stories of driving a, an old combi across Europe back when Yugoslavia was Yugoslavia and, you know, they, they had that adventurous spirit and they took me travelling from a young age. I was really lucky with that. Yeah. Uh, so I guess travelling's kind of just, just been in the blood and as soon as I finished school, I uh, went overseas and uh, even then I joined the army pretty young out of school and I had a 12-month wait for the army. Yeah. And my mum said to me, she's like, I'm – don't sit around Western Sydney waiting for, you know, just killing time for 12 months. And she, she actually bought me a plane ticket to Europe, Yeah, you know, so that was a 19 year old being bought a plane ticket to Europe by her mom. You know, she was such a big supporter and just saying, go, go experience a bit of the world and kind of never really stopped. Um, and then the fitness thing, you know, I came from an active family, but, uh, you know, really took a, a shining and a passion to it with the army. Cause I've always had a, an active job. So from the army and then to firefighting, it's a, a, uh, a job that requires, you know, a pretty high level of physical work capacity. So yeah. um, I think being fit allows me to, I guess, adventure a bit more when I travel. There's nothing when I'm overseas that I can't, I feel like I can't do. There's no sort of mountain I can't climb or no activity I can't get involved in. Yeah, um, no And I think having that, that base level of fitness, you know, you're just keen to, to keep going. And I've, you've probably got a bit more energy than maybe the average person as well. So yeah. I don't think they didn't develop together, but they definitely complement each other. For sure. I mean, the reason I was kind of asked is because, I mean, you know me and the, well, the guy I used to be and what I do now and I've still got ways to go, but I found, you know, like I definitely see things differently now in the way that, you know, I feel A, able to take more things on, but B, I kind of like want to because you're just constantly pushing that level of what you can and can't do and the things that I see that are possible now that probably weren't possible in the yeah. past and that was just such a limitation i had on myself so 
I've always been envious of that of that trait that you've had for sure. So it's nice to be sort of stepping up to your level, not quite to your level, but um, oh mate, not that getting uh, somewhere along those lines. Would you run sixty cool. odd k around your neighbourhood block? Yeah, yeah. That was yeah, last year. Yeah, yeah, mate, I've never done yeah. that. Yeah, but you've done you did the uh, the ice marathon in Greenland. Yeah, the, right? it's called the the oh, I did the polar bear challenge. Yeah, which was the. Yeah, marathon, then a half marathon the next day as well. So it's you know sixty three over two days, um, but on the on the polar ice cap itself in um, kind of like the central Greenland. Yeah, yeah, that's so rad. Um, like what? Where was the drive for that to do? Like where did the whole idea even start? Uh, well, the, the starting point was I want to go to Greenland. Yeah, to be honest, and you remember the movie The Secret Life of Walter Mitty? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, my my travel inspiration places I want to go to usually comes from making me as simple as a, a postcard, a picture, a screen, yeah. a shot in a movie, just some things like oh, I want to go see, just I want to go see that, that I want to do that. Yeah. yeah. So I remember watching that movie and that was it. Like I'm going to Greenland. Uh, and then I can't even remember how I stumbled across it, but I came across this page or this event page for the polar circle marathon. And I was just like, well, there it is. There's my, my excuse, my reason to get yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and that, yeah, that, that was enough to, to take me over there and, and just incredible, uh, yeah, incredible race. Like that was my first time seeing, you know, big glaciers and, you know, just a, an endless sea of ice and you know, the ice caps, just incredible. Um, just, you know, everything I, I wanted to do, um, because of the race, it, it took me there to do those things, you know? So yeah. uh, it wasn't just the race itself, you know, my first time going dog sledding and all these sort of things and ice fishing and, yeah. you know, and then and luckily running took me there. That's rad. And because you went with, it was just you or you, you went with a friend or you met someone over there? Cause I remember. It, was, it was just me. Yeah. yeah. I, I went on my own uh, and I, I met a guy there from the British Army. Um, lovely dude. And we kind of you know bonded over a military service. And on the second day, we had like an, unseason, like an unseasonably, un, yeah, whatever that was. Like an unseasonal sort of change in the world. Yeah, so it was, it was basically it was just a warmer night. Okay. And all the snow on the ice cap kind of melted away. So the ice cap, you know, it can be 5, 10 degrees and the ice cap stays frozen. It's, you know, self-cooling. Yeah. But all the snow cover came off it and that was pretty much all of your, all of your friction, all of your grip yeah. gone. You know, and we had running crampons on over our, um, over a Gore-Tex trail shoe with gaiters, but it, they just weren't cutting the mustard and this guy that I'd met, he, his, his snapped pretty early on. Um, and cause we were together, it was like, all right, well, we need to get off this ice cap together as a team. Uh, just, there was no talk about leaving him there. So I took one of my crampons off, gave it to him. Um, so we both had our outside feet in crampons and it was arms around the shoulder, <laughs> both like stepping in unison yeah. as a team, making sure we had one crampon shoe, you know, left and left and right and right. And we had one, one shoe between the feet, you know, yeah. at any one time moving. <laughs> and we were the last, last two off the ice cap, um, but it was just an incredible experience, you know. We did about six or seven K like that. That's just, epic. You know, and you got it done. Got it done. And yeah. it's like, if, if you've ever been down to your local ice rink, you know, and w- tried to walk on the ice, that's basically what it was like for, for kilometres. Yeah. We're laughing the whole way though, you know. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you wouldn't get that in any normal scenario or situation, I no. guess. And yeah, and not leaving in like to, to go and do that for someone. Yeah, well, I think just for both of us, you know, having that, that army background, like you never leave a man behind. So, yeah, yeah. there's no, it was, all right, well, this is a situation. How do we get out of this? Yeah. How, and how is your friendship now? I mean, obviously, you, you would have created a pretty strong bond over that experience as well, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. It's just one of those experiences. Like, I wouldn't have to talk to him for years, but we'll never, never forget this. You've and he was that. an interesting guy. He's the, you know, ex army, did about 10 years, 12 years. And, uh, he just has this this thing inside him, probably similar to me. So he's married with kids and just like once a year, his wife just says, go do something. Yeah. You need to go and do something. Yeah. So this year, yeah. I'm going to fly to Greenland and do this race. I just need to. And he needs that in, inside him. Yeah. So his wife understands that and that's how we cross paths over there. Pretty that's similar people like except uh, no wife and kids for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's Yeah, I mean, it's hard to – as a same sort of thing for me obviously a young family and and married and that and it's we're very lucky in the way that we've got good partners and a family that understands you know you let you you've got to let each other be who you are you know you don't want to restrict each other through relationships and allow each other to still grow and be our own absolutely versions of ourselves individually so we're very lucky in that yeah aspect but then other times it's kind of like okay you need to go and put your shoes on and go for a run because you're driving me insane so <laughs> yeah. i've been kind of going through that 
a little bit over the last couple of weeks with a little bit yeah. of foot soreness. So yeah, I've had ex girlfriends in the past that have I've come home, you know, from a, a bad day at work or something, and they're like, "Don't talk, shoes yeah. on, go for a run." You go. Speak to me now when you get back. Yeah, and it, it does work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 that outlet, I suppose. It could be anything. It could be the surfboard. It could be time on the water. Yeah. You know, around a golf. It's just that one thing for everyone. So definitely understand where that's coming yep. from um, i'm hoping i think the foot's feeling better i've, I've had a bit of um a few scans I've, I've been to see the doctor and a few things it's and it's it seems to be writing itself so i'm hoping while they're up here we can get out and show some more of these amazing trails that have been created since since yeah. you were here last yeah mate I look forward to hitting them but like yeah. i said as well like a, a walk's as good as a run for me these days i've yeah found a, a big love of walking as i'm getting older too oh man like yeah. I, you know i've been watching you, with it, with being out of the game and not being able to really walk anywhere, I've been doing a lot of reading and mm. watching some cool shows and that. And yeah, some of the hiking shows are so good. You know, like instead of just sort of running through everything and yeah. seeing it at a blur, walking, hiking, taking more of it in, setting up camp and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. I've, I've, I'm sort of getting drawn into that as well. That's what I found Greenland was like because the landscape was just so stunning to to run yeah. through. But often I just stop and walk for a bit and just yeah. like really enjoy it, take it in and just you know. Yeah. And then I'd go back to jogging and I'd jog a couple of Ks and then I'd find somewhere that I really wanted to be and I'd just go back to walking and just slow down and take it in. And Well, that's all part of the experience, right? You, yeah. You're out there for that, so you're kind of mad if you don't stop. That's it, and yeah. Take it. I do it all the time up the back even. I'll run the same trails all the time, but I just love it. It's so grateful I can leave my house and don't have to drive anywhere and go out and explore. So, yeah, hopefully this week we'll be able to go and check some out. For sure. Out. That's rad, man. Um so, I mean, going from traveling, obviously that's taken a bit of a, a a downward turn with COVID and that, and it kind of is a double-edged blade with the whole travel thing with more people getting out. You know, we've been speaking to friends lately and a lot of people, you know, that this town's getting interest where people are realizing they don't have to live in the city for work. Now, you can work online and it's freeing people up to not have to live in the city. So we're definitely getting a lot of people moving here from the eastern states and and stuff like that. And I think that's kind of happening everywhere. Yeah. But, yeah, freeing people up to travel and, and go up and down the coast. I mean, we've had so many visitors in the last two years um, because, yeah, they can't go overseas. But they're seeing more and more of, of WA. So it's it's really cool. Yeah. I feel bad sometimes coming up to visit because I know... You know, the Exmouth crew especially, it's just an endless sea of southern friends coming through, particularly once that weather gets colder down south. Yeah, I mean, and this year, I think, I mean, you're the, you're, you're probably the first of the, the guys that we've had come up from down south. I'll try from, to get in early this year. Perth and, yeah, down, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a good move, Before right? everyone <laughs> else, before we get tired of all the company, I'll try to <laughs> yeah. beat the rush. No, it's a smart move. But, you know, um, a lot more people are travelling. And, and what I'm noticing even now this year is a lot of people that usually go to the coast are now going inland as well. Yeah. Um, and people are getting drawn to the outback and you know a, a whole different experience which um you know, i spend a lot of time out there and definitely have yeah. that love and respect for that as well so it's really cool to see how everyone's diversifying and getting all these different experiences which they probably wouldn't have got before yeah for sure hmm. well you're firefighting i mean you're an incredibly fit guy we're going to try and get some sessions in this week because i need to up my mobility and strength game which i definitely want to try and get some um, info out of you for that but on top of that the other reason i was kind of getting in to speak was that you were involved with the backpacker medics organization which is something really cool i mean at this time it feels like the world kind of needs something like that at the moment with this pandemic but i mean pre-covid you guys were traveling all over the world to help out um, yeah, yeah it's, it's a hard time for us just because with COVID, we, we just can't get overseas where we are an international organization. So Australian based, but our work is is in um, the developing world. So, you know, there's as much need as ever uh, around the, the place and we, we just can't get there, unfortunately. So it's, it's challenging to have to just to sit back. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, yeah. But I know everyone from the team starting to get pretty antsy about wanting to you know, get out there and continue doing the work that we do. Yeah, the, I mean, the team you've got, you all play different roles and it's and the organisation, it's purely voluntary based. So you guys are all volunteers and all your travelling and all your funds and that is you fund it, you're self-funded as well. So Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's the way Backpack Medics work. So uh, the team itself, we're a, um, we respond a, uh, 
a mobile uh, medical team to remote areas following a kind of natural disaster. Yeah. Um, so it takes a, a lot of traveling to get to these places. Uh, and we were, one of the things we wanted to do was make sure it wasn't just, you know, uh, a bit of a jaunt for people like, you know, just trying to get a tick in the box or a bit of experience. So the way we work is if you want to come, you pay for your own flights, you pay for your own uniforms. Um, you know, everyone from the organization contributes in some way to some sort of organizational position. You know, we, we have a lot of backroom work that needs to be done. We don't pay any salaries. We don't pay any advertising. Um, so that way we only get people that are really passionate about kind of making a difference in the, you know, hard hit communities in the developing world. Um, and then also the, from a fundraising perspective, uh, when people ask, you know, like, well, where does my money go to? And we can proudly say 100% of the cash you give us goes to operational costs. You yeah, know, right. that's, to to. you know, medicines, medical supplies, you know, whatever we need on the ground to get care to where it's needed most. So yeah. um, that's, you know, that's... A, we hope to be able to continue to operate that way forever. Um, you know, if we, if we do grow as an organization, you know, we're hoping not to have to change that structure because we, we love yeah. that about the org. Yeah, and I think the good thing about it is it, it's it's proving people's commitment. You know, yeah. I think some people, like say, they, they might get a paid-for plane ticket and accommodation. It's a kind of an easy way for someone to see areas and yeah. just, you know, knowing that they're getting it supplied, whereas if you were doing it all yourself, you're 100% yeah. committed to yeah to doing what you do. It also makes the money just go a lot further. Yeah, so our last, sure. our last deployment was the earthquake and tsunami in Sulawesi yeah. uh, in Indonesia. We rotated three teams over a month there and our operational costs were about 15 grand. Wow. You know, so it's not, that's not a lot of money when you, yeah. when you think about it. And we, yeah. like, we've got, you know, we can continue that sort of forever if we, if we keep our costs down like that. But if you look at the number of people we deployed, I mean, if you look at if we'd taken on their travel costs and everything, that 15 grand would have cost 50. Yeah, you know, that's so right. Yeah, we're, getting, getting, you know, we're getting a lot more benefit from the money that we do receive. Um, and we're just asking for a bit of a commitment from from the people that, that do deploy. So I can understand it's a bit of a hard sell sometimes, but we don't struggle for numbers at all. There's enough people out there. You know, we, we you and I know we've got it so good over here. Yeah, that's right. Not just right. in Australia and the developed world, but in WA in particular. You know, we, we, we want for nothing. Yeah. Uh, so I think everyone's pretty happy to, to contribute a bit of their own um, to really, yeah, pay back or pay it forward. I mean, I, I, you just can't, you can't fault those people because not only are you giving up your time and paying your own way, you're taking holidays you're taking time off work so you're going unpaid for those times as well i mean some and it's not you know these are probably times where you're not you're going beyond what your four weeks a year allow in your in your holidays for work and stuff like that right yeah we're definitely aware of that as well that people do take their their time away from work yeah uh, a lot of us you know most of us for state government employees and now our leave is pretty good yeah. um you know or you know if you're a nurse or a doctor in a hospital or a firefighter like myself you know, everyone at my work's always really helpful, you know, so if I needed, you know, half a dozen shifts covered to allow me to, to do a trip, people are always put their hand up and then I can pay those shifts back when I get back. Yeah. Uh, the hospital crew, uh, pretty much the same. Our paramedics, very similar. So uh, we, we've all got supportive workplaces that help us out. Um, but yeah, you, you do, you, you know, it could be, for me, it could be two weeks surfing in Indonesia or it could be two weeks, you know, at an earthquake in Indonesia. And um, like you said before, like I've, I've traveled a lot. Yeah. I feel like I've... I can, you know, I'm never going to want to stop traveling, but I can balance it within myself. Well, like, well yeah. now maybe I'll take half the amount of holidays I normally would have and the other half of my time I really want to, you know, continue to contribute to, to helping these communities. And, and I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing sometimes. I mean, sometimes you go into areas of, uh, of unrest and, you know, it's it can be pretty uh, pretty daunting and, and, and even dangerous with some of the areas you've been, right? Like, I mean, it's, yeah, it's not yeah. always that easy. So there's there's also an element of, a, you've got to kind of know what you're doing, and B, I mean, you've got to be pretty ballsy, right, to go to some of those places. Yeah, we, we, we try to be as risk-averse as possible, yeah. um, but we're definitely... So we, we respond to natural disasters and then also humanitarian emergencies. Yeah. Most of the humanitarian emergencies, they're a result of civil conflict or some sort of civil strife. So um, we spent six months as an organisation in the southeast of Bangladesh um, in a place called Cox's Bazaar. Yeah. And that was in response to the um, Rohingya refugee crisis. Rohingya were a, a Muslim minority in northwestern Myanmar. Yeah. Um, and it was a, or you, we can call it what it is, which was an ethnic cleansing campaign against yep. the Rohingya 
um, Muslim minority by by the nationalist Mean Marie's government. Uh, so when we were there, um, you know, over the space of a, a very short, you know, six to eight weeks, a million people fled, crossed the border, um, and they were as they fled, they were they were attacked. You know, so we stood on one side of a river, and we watched on the other side of the river. We could see the villages burning. Yeah. Um, you know, gunshots were fired. You know, as they were leaving, gunshots were being fired over their heads, over to the riverbanks where we were. Um, you know, it, it was a an yeah, yeah insecure environment. Yeah. Um, you know, so we, we try to we do have a lot of ex military people as well. Uh, a lot of people that are, sometimes we'll we'll choose our teams. You know, we're like, well, if we think this is a little bit more dangerous than another operation, we'll yeah. take those that have those uh, experience in working in hostile environments. Um, yeah, and we try sure. not to put people at risk, but also sometimes you have to go to risk adverse locations to actually be a benefit. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and I, when the when we first got to to Bangladesh, um, yeah, I remember on our I think it was our second or third day, and we got into a camp, and there was about twenty thousand people in a uh, they called it a spontaneous settlement. You know, so there's very Bangladesh is a developing, overpopulated, developing world yeah. country itself. You know, so they don't have a lot of government infrastructure to deal with. You know, an influx of a million people. Yeah. So, you know, the Rohingyas that were coming over, they were kind of just settling wherever they stopped, you know. So we came into a settlement. There was about 20,000 people there. No support whatsoever from the Bangladeshi government for that location at that time. Um, no sanitation, you know, no food supplies yet, no clean water, no wells had been sunk. And most of these people had been, you know, horrifically attacked on the way out. You know, yeah. and it was a, for some people it was a week for some people, it was three weeks, that journey to cross, you know. And they crossed carrying gunshot wounds, you know, severe machete wounds. Yeah. Um, you know, so they, they were severely injured and still having to just trek through the jungle um, for weeks on end to kind of get to where we were. So when we, the, the first day we arrived in that camp and we, you know, we had multiple gunshot wounds, flesh wounds, um, you know, necrotic tissue, so tissue that had been dying, um, yeah. you know. As that one day was probably the most useful I've ever felt in my entire life. Yeah. You know, just just For because sure. we were prepared to go into these areas, um, you know, where maybe other people weren't. Yeah, and there's nothing set up there, so you're pretty much just bringing everything you've the only the things you've brought in. Yeah. With no existing um, nothing we infrastructure or anything. We got a we had a van. We got our vans as close as we could, and then we put everything on our backs. Hence the name Backpacker yeah. Medics, and we, yeah. we hiked in for a couple of k down a muddy trail into where the settlement was, and. Um, we got some bamboo poles and put a tarp up over the roof and that was our clinic wow. and that was it. And we, we sat there and we sat there till, you know, the daylight faded and we treated every single person we could. And then we went back the next day and the next day and we kind of continued on. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, you've got all of this going on and you're getting in there to help with n- no infrastructure. I mean, and even like how, how you guys received, I mean, obviously there's risks with, what the people are running from hopefully they're in it's safer areas um but yeah received by the people you're treating let alone you know yeah other people was, would sort of think that you're taking sides with you know who you're treating as well you ever have problems with that yeah we, we're always we're always dealing with you know potentially hostile governments so yeah. the bangladeshi government wasn't that keen to have you know a lot of us there right. we we had to work a lot of backroom sort of channels to even be able to get an NGO visa to be in the country. And even yeah. then, you know, we were stopped by the military a lot because they didn't want us in certain areas. And, yeah. you know, we were pulled over by the police on multiple occasions. Um, they tried to confiscate our drone. Um, you know, we were stopped from exiting the country because they wanted yeah. camera footage from drones. They didn't want this sort of, you know, they didn't want this getting out. Cause yeah, it, sure. I guess from their perspective, they probably thought it was, you know, didn't reflect fantastically on them. And all things considering, I think the Bangladeshi government did about the best they could yeah. With that situation at that time, you know, yeah. I won't comment on, you know, how it's been kind of since then. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we kind of had to navigate that. But if, you know, if we hadn't kept at it and kept pushing and kept pushing to get to that, then we wouldn't have walked into that camp that day. And we wouldn't have, you know, been able to, you know, to, to do the work we did. And, um, yeah, you know, if, if we didn't, no one was going to, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, that just goes to say how, like, epic it is the work that you guys do for that you know and and i mean what is it in a person that makes you a put your life aside to do that and then put your life at risk amongst all these other things i mean where where does that come from inside to to do that sort of stuff i mean um that's that's a good question i think for me 
it's, it's definitely it's sort of in the family. Yeah. Um, my grandfather was very big in the Rotary Club. Uh, he was a an engineer in the army, same as myself, and yeah. uh, was in World War Two in Papua New Guinea. And then when he came back, he was um, he's a good Christian man and very active in his church. And, yeah. But very active in Rotary and in the uh, Southern Highlands of New South Wales, is you know a park that's still named after him, um, just because of how you know big a part he played in his community. Yeah. Uh, and then my my dad, um, again, just a very generous, charitable man. You know, I've, I've learned so much of you know what I have from him. Yeah. He works for an organisation called Community Aid Abroad. It's now called Oxfam. Everyone would have heard yeah, of okay, Oxfam. Yeah. It's a big yeah. multinational NGO. Yeah. Um, but dad was heavily involved in what was community aid abroad at the time in New South Wales, so right up on the, the New South Wales kind of board of, of the org. Um, and he, he, you know, just put in hours and hours and hours um, yeah. for for that, that organisation. So, you know, from a young age, I watched him do that. And I think, you know, you, you, everyone learns from their role models and everybody wants to kind of emulate their parents. So from as long as I can remember, my dad was you know doing some sort of volunteer or charity work and i remember my grandfather the way he was always spoken about as well and uh yeah just kind of i think mainly mainly because of dad's work um yeah. both my parents as well were you know my grandfather was in the army both my parents were public high school teachers my sister and myself now both work and she's in healthcare, and i'm i'm in the fire service so we you know we come from a bit of a, a family of of government service you know, that's just something that we've we've always done. And then dad's charity work, it just left a pretty big impression on me. Um, so as soon as I as soon as I could, you know, I really started trying to get involved in, in similar things. And then luckily because of my, my work experience with the army and a few other bits and pieces, um, I found a, a an avenue that I could, you know, sort of contribute to and, and uh, yeah, wait for me to... Yeah, skill set. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, sometimes, you know... It wasn't always easy, I guess. Um, a really good friend of mine, um, Brad Stewart, you know, one of my best mates in the army. We met uh, at Common Engineer School, and he was very similar to me. You know, we've always been kind of passionate about you know wanting to do a bit more. It was very hard to do this work once we we're in the army, but I think we both knew once we left the army, uh, it's something we wanted to kind of be involved in. Um, and initially, you know, we when a when something would happen, like the the big typhoon in the Philippines in Tacloban years ago, or major earthquake, or something yeah. like that, I, th- I think it, it was quite amateurish at the time. But we'd get on the phone, or we'd send an email, or whatever, and we're like, "Hey, you know, this is who we are. These are my skills. I'd love to get involved." And never heard anything. And we're like, "Okay, well, that's that's being reactive. Let's be proactive." So we waited until nothing was happening, and then we would approach the same organisations and. You know, I guess in our heads, we just, we felt like we could be useful. Yeah. You know, yeah. hopefully these people would think we're useful as well. Um, and again, unfortunately, just just nothing, you know, not, not even an email back, nothing. Wow. Uh, and then I remember I came across Backpacker Medics. So Backpacker Medics was an existing organization run by um, my other good mate, Nathan Burns, a paramedic from WA at the time. And Nathan started this this brilliant organization um they're up in the the mountains in nepal and they had a community health care center yeah and at the time they were sending student paramedics so people that were you know trained to be ambulance officers uh in the cities they were sending them over there for two week stints and i remember seeing it and i was like that's that's brilliant i'd love to be involved and I, I emailed nath at the time and we spoke and he's like unfortunately like i was a medic i was a combat medic in the army not a paramedic yeah my skills weren't quite high enough and he's like i'm really sorry mate but yeah we, we were for paramedics only my good mate brad he would changed over from firefighting into paramedicine so he was doing that and i was like well mate i was told brad here's an organization i can't get involved but yeah. you could yeah and so brad got involved went over to nepal you know fell in love with with the organization and you know really bonded with nath who's just in, you know the most incredible person uh, and he, he became pretty heavily involved. Um, and that kind of led us through to 2015, which was the Kathmandu earthquake yeah. in Nepal. Because backpack, backpack and medics already had that relationship with the country, when that earthquake happened and it was so devastating, you know, Brad and Nath kind of sat there and like, we've got to do something. We're, you know, we're an NGO. We, we are based in Nepal. We've got to do something. I remember speaking to Brad at the time and, 
you know, he said that him and Nate were thinking about maybe trying to get a team together and send them over and just seeing how we can help out. And I, was, I just told him, I'm coming. Yeah. <laughs> I had no relationship <laughs> with Backpack and Expo. I was like, I'm yeah. coming. Yeah. He's like, and he called me back. He's like, hey, mate, I think, I think just me and Nate are going to go. And then yeah. once we get on the ground, you know, maybe we'll, we'll call for a team. I was like, yeah, that's, that's cool, bro. Uh, I'm going to get on the same plane. Yeah. You can't actually stop me. And I'll be in Kathmandu. <laughs> Shift and rubble if I have to. Yeah, and then if you some. call for a team, yeah. I'll be there already. And if you don't call for a team, mate, I'll just do my own thing. I'll help out where I can. Yeah. Which is pretty naive at the time. That's the last thing we want is an influx of people that don't actually have an ability to help. And I've, I've learned that now. Um, but in the end, they ended up deciding to take a team. We, we got a team of uh, eight or nine together and we, we went over. Um, and that's that's kind of where the, the disaster response group of backpack and medics kind of came about. Yeah. Um, was you know responding to those natural natural disasters and we've since now shut down that healthcare center and all we do is the the disaster response work okay um, which has yeah. Yeah, become the prime focus for the, the organization and it all started from that from that earthquake from us initially just just going over um, just wanted to help in some way yeah yeah and what, what happened was we we got there and we registered with the world health organization and we you know we we were all part of the the formal response and then we got told, okay, day one, go set up in this area of the city and set up a clinic. And we, we went there and we set up a little clinic and people came through with just, you know, what we call uh, cough, colds, sore holes, you know, like yeah. just little grazes or <laughs> yeah. just, you know, just a bit of a cold and like, well, that's, this is not acute, you know, medical requirements from the earthquake. This is just treating the general population, yeah. which is not a bad thing, but it's kind of, you know, we, we this was devastating. I think it was about 10,000 killed, you know, 100,000 injured. We knew there was people kind of being missed. So we, we spent a morning there and we really didn't feel like we were of much benefit. And we, we thought, well, why don't we, why don't we try a different tact? And we ended up getting some vehicles and we had our local uh, interpreters and we were like, well, let's, let's head out, out. Let's get out of the city and let's see, see what we find. So we went out into these rural areas. And as we went, we spoke to people and we developed intel. And sure enough, we'd be, you know, a 12 hour drive away from Kathmandu up in the mountains, you know, in the lower Himalayas. And we came across the village and we, we come across these people with really significant injuries that hadn't had any treatment yet. Yeah. And what we found out, or what we found out was, you know, when these sort of disasters happen, particularly in the developing world, um, if your injury is life threatening, immediately life threatening, those people will get to help. Yeah. They'll find a way, you know, the, the village will find a way, they'll get them into the city or wherever they need to be. But it's those people with probably serious injuries that are probably, you know, they're at a risk of infection and then that, that infection could become quite serious if not treated. But because they consider it a lower risk at the time, they, they, just, they just don't seek help. Yeah, it's not, not directly life-threatening. So they yeah, kind of yeah, exactly. Back, so yeah. We, we kind of identify these people are going to fall through the cracks. Um, and so we started doing that and we, we'd go out for a couple of days, we'd find these villages, we'd get all these people that needed treatment that wasn't immediately life-threatening but were going to deteriorate and... Yeah. We kind of found a niche there and we found that no one else was really sort of doing that. So we went back and we go again. We went back to Kathmandu, resupplied, went again, and we just found like, well, this is maybe this is a gap in, you know, the you know, the the NGO, you know, response industry where yeah. medical teams aren't really getting out and about. Um, and that's, you know, for, for no particular reason, but a clinic can be quite a, a big process to set up. You need vehicle access or you need, you know, your average doctor or nurse that shows up might not be that fit and we just thought, well, we're already called backpacker medics. Why can't we throw everything on our backs when the road ends and hike in and find, you know, find these places? And that's that's what we did and that's what's worked for us. And that's where we are now, which is the, the backpacker medics disaster response group. And that's what we do. You know, we're, we're mobile, we're light, we're self-contained. So uh, we're self-sufficient. We carry our own food, we carry our own water purification, we carry our own shelter. Um, we'll sleep in the field, which other teams won't do. So we carry our own, sh you know, like a a hoochie what we call you know a tarp to sleep under and we yeah. carry our own mats and we sleep on the deck and um by doing that we can get further and further away from the main urban areas and find the people that need the help that just aren't getting it yeah there must have been a great moment where you kind of found that niche and that purpose where you guys knew okay this is exactly where we need to be yeah. and uh, to help the people that weren't getting it and then to also hone in on exactly what you're doing don't need to be more efficient and more yeah, more definitely. helpful out there, right? Yeah, it felt like a bit of a eureka moment, you know. And yeah. before we even came home, because we spent a lot of time just driving in the back of this ute tray, and we were just, you know, we were already saying, like, this, we can do this, you know. We let's once we get home, let's recover, take a bit of time, and then let's get together and let's let's do this. Put you know, this is together, something yeah. we can do, and that's that's 
six years ago now and we, yeah. we, we're we still going strong um, with that same model and it is working for us. So it's loving rad. it. Yeah, and, and you guys have all got you, – you each bring something to the group. I mean, everyone's got that different skill set where they're useful. So, yeah, there's not like – there's no one out there that hasn't got that purpose like you were saying before yeah. or you, know, you, you all contribute because I think you're like in logistics and stuff like that, right? Yeah, so I'm the logistics manager for the yeah. organisation. So um, I don't have, you know, the, the required medical skills to be, you know, frontline healthcare. I, yeah. I just don't. Like I'm more of a first aid or a responder, but I can look after the team. So I make sure our suppliers, you know, our packs, our shelter, all that sort of stuff, you know, that's good to go. And then also I can throw the gloves on and help and treat other people. So yeah. we usually send a team of about eight couple of doctors a couple of nurses a couple of paramedics and then a few logistics people plus yeah. our translators yeah um that'll be our, our team and everyone you know really compliments each other and we've got we just have the most wonderful people you know our volunteers are incredible yeah i could um, imagine and every time someone gets involved and deploys that they, they always want to help out more like how can i help the organization more yeah um you got a lot of it a lot of a lot of veterans a lot of people that left the army and I think one of the big issues now where we're, we're having a lot of issues with veteran suicide um, yeah. is losing that that big picture of that feeling like you were doing something in the army and, you know, I guess normal civilian life doesn't always feel like that. Yeah. But getting involved in an organisation like Backpacker Medics, um, I think for a lot of people can be that, well, then you feel like you're really, you're really making a difference on a, a big scale again. I think having a purpose is just such yep. an important part of of your life and yeah mental sanity and and all of those things that, that people like that want to have I, mean, yeah. I think having a purpose is such an important part of yeah absolutely of that yeah yeah for sure i mean if you're doing that yeah i mean you're, you're taking long periods of time off work then you're coming home i mean you, you need time to get over that too i mean it's not like you've just some people go away and they go on holidays and they come back to work ready to go but how do you go transitioning back into a you know getting back to work and then having time off to to get over what you've been through? I mean, so like yeah. I said before, some of that stuff's pretty horrific. Yeah. Um, yeah, getting over that trauma and getting yourself back into the, um, yeah the normal or the real world, I guess, or the day to day. Yeah, it can be it can be challenging. I find usually on a deployment, we'll go for a couple of weeks. It's you know nonstop long days, sixteen hour, eighteen hour days. Um, and your body overcompensates, you know, the, not just like that short-term adrenaline boost, but your body knows I'm here to work and it just keeps you going. You know, you work on sleep deprivation for an extended period of time. And I find as soon as I get back, usually I collapse, you know. Yeah. And I, I find, yeah. I'm, you know, pretty much every time I get home, I get sick. Yeah. Um, the last time I got home, I got tonsillitis a week later. Like, it's just, the body just crashes, you know. Everything is put off and yeah. managed to fight off while it's defending itself yeah. to get through that moment just, yeah, finally fails. Yeah. But I, I, to be honest, I probably didn't have much in way of coping mechanisms until Bangladesh. Yeah. Um, Bangladesh, I did three trips in a, a pretty short space of time because it was just, you know, a million people that it, you know, had just been on the, the end of a, a brutal campaign of ethnic cleansing on the, on the back of decades of just, you know, being mistreated, yeah. you know, by by a government. So, you know, I just, I probably didn't have three trips in me, but yeah. I just also felt like there was that, I just had to. Had that um, drive. And that was probably the first time I've, I've you know, burnt out, I yeah. guess. Um, so I came home and I was burnt out and I didn't have those coping me mechanisms and that kind of, got me on the path of, of uh, you know, self-care and optimization and, you know, everything that now that I call, you know, my, my self-care routine, yeah. which I didn't have then, you know, that it's taken years to develop that. But yeah. now I kind of, now I have that body awareness. I can feel when I'm crashing, I can catch myself, you know. Um, you know, I can, I, you, I can use things like my heart rate variability yeah. to tell me that my nervous system's stressed and yeah. I'm in my sympathetic nervous system you know, my fight or flight as opposed to my parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah. We can actually use markers for that now. And this is stuff that, you know. It's pretty cool. Yeah, didn't know three, yeah. four years ago. And now I've, I've got a pretty good handle on it. I can catch myself before burnout a lot quicker. And I also know if I am getting to that point, what mechanisms I can use to, to bring me back and to, to settle me down. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's really important for people in the military, in any sort of stressful environment. But I think, to be honest, just modern day life has become so stressful that everyone probably needs it, mm. you know, and that's that's why yoga is becoming so popular. You know, if you haven't heard the word meditation in the last four or five years, where have you been, oh, you know? Yeah. 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 
breath work, Wim Hof, ice baths, um, all of this stuff that wasn't around before. But like all of a sudden, everyone's tired and everyone's burnt out and no yeah. one's sleeping well. Yeah. You know, and so that's that's been a pretty steep learning curve for me over the last three years, realizing, well, here's, I want to be doing this work. I want to be giving as much as I can back. But you if I don't do look after myself, time. yeah. Yeah. I can't run right. myself into the ground. So, you know, how do we cope? How do we cope with work stress, modern day stress? And that's, it's been a pretty big deep dive, you know, to, to get a handle on it. Yeah. It's allowing yourself that time to get back to the person that you need to be. Yeah. It's so many people, um, I think they operate on a level where they just feel like they have to give all the time. Yeah. And, you know, people get stressed because you, you can't operate like that all the time. You have to take moments to take yourself away from the situation, whether you think it's being selfish or putting that guilt on yourself. I mean, you can't be optimised all the time. You just you just can't, no, you can't. do it. And, but a way to be when you do have that chance to be optimum yeah. is to give yourself that time away to yeah. completely disengage and rebuild yourself and allow yeah. yourself to have that time guilt-free. Yeah. But once... Once you kind of build that awareness of your body and you can start feeling, you know, for yeah. a lot of people, something as simple as driving in peak hour traffic, mate, it gets my, like, it gets my yeah. blood pressure going. So yeah. I've, I've shifted into the Perth City Station now. Yeah. You know, so I used to drive, you know, a couple of minutes down the coast to my old station. Now I've got to drive 40 minutes in peak hour traffic yeah. often and it's, mate, it's a killer. Yeah. I don't know how people do it every day. I've only got to do it, you know, a couple of times a week for my shifts. Yeah. Um, but I know when I feel my blood pressure rising, I'm stressed about the traffic. It's like, all right, cool. Yeah, maybe it's turned the podcast off I'm listening to, which was a good distraction. But yeah. all right, I'm going to do five or ten minutes of breath work because I've just driven to a night shift in peak hour traffic and I don't want to yeah. work rock up for a night shift already jacked up. Yeah. All right, so cool. You know, I'll, I'll turn the, the music or the podcast off and I'll put a, a breath work, you know, uh, I've got a little app and things, put a breath yeah. work program on and I'll just sit there and box breathe for the last ten minutes as I arrive at station. And, and while you're, the, you're good. Yeah, 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 you know. So yeah. doing things like deep nasal breathing, slowing my respirate, um, I've stimulated my vagus nerve, I've shifted myself back into a parasympathetic nervous system state. Yeah. And now I'm walking into my work, you know, de-stressed. Good. Yeah. Or less stressed than I would have been. And that was simply triggered by just sitting in traffic. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, that's the whole part, like the the, the self-awareness and, and uh, I guess – being aware of the triggers that yeah. set you off and knowing that okay this is gonna this mm. is starting to trigger me and being aware of that and going okay i'm not gonna i'm not gonna follow this up with you know reacting the way i normally would or yeah. changing the way that you react uh it's a powerful tool yeah definitely you know being aware in that state um you know it's it's everywhere yeah you know from me trying to look after the kids and and function and do things on the side while keeping everyone sane and not getting too wound up. And a yep. part of that is, is me because yep. I find the more wound up I get, that energy mm. just flows on to everyone else. So it's like, okay, I need to, I need to bring this whole situation yeah, down right now. Yeah, and everyone reacts to you. It starts you know. with me. So I'm going to bring it down and your trigger or you being triggered can become their trigger. Exactly. Oh, dad's yeah. stressed. Yeah. And now they're all jacked up yeah. as well, you yeah. know, and the way that it works, what, what I've learned is, you know, is, sympathetic nervous system arousal the more you trigger it the faster it triggers that's right and the stronger those triggers become and it doesn't yeah. you know, a lot of people think you know coming from the military and working in a fire station like i remember when i was in afghanistan you know we'd be rocketed you know and when the the, the bomb alarm or the sirens would go off and rockets would start coming and you're lying on the ground that's a pretty strong trigger right you know you, you're lying on the ground with your hands on your head and then you crawl onto a bomb shelter to get out of the the blast way and then um that's you know that that definitely that's but that's when you should be triggered you know yeah. that's that's fine you know it's the same at the fire station when the bells go and we've got a job straight away it's a survival that's, mechanism that's what it is that's, there what's, for, yeah. that's what it's for yeah but because it becomes triggered so regularly all of a sudden you know someone cuts you off in traffic it becomes the or norm. just just the traffic or you know you know the, you, the your dog that you love just won't stop barking or something you know it just gets that same same response but it's not just you know the the emergency service in the military it's, it's everyone you know yeah. you, anyone can be triggered all the time and the more you buy into that trigger rather than dealing with it you know and that's why you know i think stress is the next well stress is the, for me it's the big society killer it's a at the huge moment killer yeah, yeah it is huge so you've got to work on it and everyone is stressed in different ways on different levels yeah. in a way of um you know it can be as simple as um getting likes on your phone something that you posted to 
um, stress at work or just it's it's all I think a lot of it you put on yourself as well there's yeah. such an expectation that people put on themselves yeah. uh, on across every level so how toxic and unhelpful is swiping on the phone like, yeah it's a yeah. It's, I think it's like someone said it's like the new smoking yeah. scrolling's the new smoking it is yeah um, and I'd rather smoke yeah. I'd rather be addicted to smoking. Well, than, I mean, it's a killer because it's yeah. bad for your posture as well. I mean, yeah. poor posture can lead to stress yeah. because of what it does to your your autom- autonomous nervous system. Yeah. So I'm addicted to news. Yeah. So I, me and another mate, we do a lot of the operations for backpacker medics. Yeah. So heavily invested in following global geopolitics. Okay. You know what's happening in the world, but it's yeah. oh, it's developed a news addiction. So yeah. I've got all my news subscriptions on my phone, and you know. It, these are like we've only got the West Australian here, and I don't think that much of that paper. So, yeah, okay. you know, I would love to be able to just get a paper for all the news I want to consume, but I can't. It's on my phone. Yeah. So I find myself, you know, um, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll be, I'll be told, I'll put your phone down, just, just stop reading. I can't. Like I've got to, I've got to follow every region. I've got to what's happening in the Middle East today, what's yeah. happening here, and I just can't stop, and I can't stop, and I can't stop. You know. Yeah. So that's like I need, I don't even need to be aware of that. And even, I mean, they're very good at making more and more reasons to keep you on there as oh, yeah. well. I mean, it's all the, the longer you're on using their program, the better off yeah. you. So they're going to do everything they can. But even just, it's really, it's a it's a hard one because it's, you're kind of connected socially to everyone wherever they are, but you're disconnected to like the present moment, which yeah. is, um, that's a big killer. Yep. Mindfulness says you next buzzword that you know if you haven't heard that where you've been for the last three or four years yeah well i mean you're seeing successful people now you know millionaires and billionaires and these ceos talking about journaling and meditation and being mindful and they're getting into it because it's working yeah um maybe not because they want to be spiritually mindful and aligned people but they know that it can lead to success so yeah definitely you know I think anything that you can get now, all of these things are being backed by science, so you know that they're working. Oh, yeah. It's definitely getting more attention. It's really hard when it's not being backed by science and there might be a guru who's claiming all of these things and it's like, hey, yeah, that's cool, but can you back it with with pure evidence? So, And people can now. I remember Tim Ferriss saying on one of his his podcasts, and obviously he's – the whole you know, idea of his podcast is to interview top performers in their field, whether yeah. it's athletes, businessmen, actors, whatever, get them on. What's your secrets? How do you be a top performer? Yeah. And he said the one standard response, doesn't matter what field you're in, the one uh, constant across every person is meditation practice. Yeah. Some form of meditation practice, you know. It's anecdotal, but you know, you, you basically say you can't be a top performer forever without something. Yeah, you know, without a meditation practice of some yeah. form. I think it goes back to that whole giving yourself every chance to be the best version of yourself. Yeah, you know, everyone talks about being the best version of himself and that these days, and it's not all being go 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 all the time. You, you've got to give yourself time away from that to yeah. be the best version because you're not going to be it if you're highly strung yep. all the time, you know. Some people love the chase and they love the game and they want to be the top of everything and they want to achieve and yep. make lots and lots of money and that's great for the people who want to do that. That brings them happiness and that's they're exactly where they want to be because yep. they have the energy for that. Where some people are just the total opposite. They like meditation and living quite a, a chilled, balanced life without that corporate side of it. But, I mean, whatever works for any person. I mean, if you're happy and you're doing what makes you happy and it's bringing you happiness and success and that's what you want, then, I mean, you can't can't knock anyone for doing that. Yeah, for sure. There's, um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with both of them, Dave Goggins and Jocko Willink. Yeah, I I definitely know Dave Goggins. Not so much Jocko, but yeah. It's Jocko. Jocko's another ex-Navy SEAL. Okay. Um, Wrote a fantastic book about extreme ownership. You know, yep. it's more from a leadership business perspective, but he's like he's up at like three thirty four a.m. every day, and obviously Dave Goggins, they're basically just no excuses, go 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 sort of guys, yeah. and you know they they they're captivating, and I, they're fantastic if they give you a little bit of inspiration, or enthusiasm to get out and have that next run. Sure, but Dave Goggins is a guy that gives himself rabdo on an ultra marathon, like that's that's not something to idealize for yeah. me. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I haven't seen a a little Instagram video from Goggins yet saying like, go, 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 but also make sure you get eight to nine hours sleep every night. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, so I don't Sleep think when you're does. dead, mate. You'll be dead if you do sleep. Yeah. If you don't sleep, you will be dead. It's taken years off your life. So, yeah. you know, I think... The get after it attitude 24-7. Yeah. 
you sit there and you scroll for hours and you hear these videos and you know i've just got to be at it all the time it's like oh no that's that's the last thing we need is everyone to be yeah. at it all the time well he kind of gets to it at the end of his book not to give too much away but he he said you know he was just going after it all the time and he built himself up to a way that he he wasn't doing any stretching so he was just yeah. getting harder and harder and he almost had that that slight realization moment then we're like okay yeah. i need to start stretching so yeah in a way he's kind of he's got that side of it and yep. he stretches he's he's an intense guy so anything yeah. he does he does two hours of stretching a night yeah yep every night but that's his thing he loves his routine as yep. well you know so he, he's found out whatever yep. works for him and he sticks with it yeah every day I, Jocko puts his like a photo of his watch on of his wake up time yep and you know 3 30 3 40 4 a.m is like that's great when did you go to bed yeah you know like yeah. I'm all for getting up and seizing the day, but if yeah. you know, make sure if you want to get up at three thirty, great. Go to bed at seven thirty. Yeah. Otherwise, and, don't be Jocko. Well, it's it's obviously it works for them. It's it's it doesn't yeah. work for everyone, and it, it comes back to that whole thing about definitely take what you what you like out of those guys. Yeah. If you've if they've said something that resonates for you, and it's something that it has given you an edge to your journey or your your storyline take it but you don't yeah. it's not gospel you don't have to live by no. it i mean i think even even um buddha and that had sort of said that before he you know went to the next side he said take what you want out of this yeah. it's not gospel don't live my way and don't live my word for word what i've been yeah. putting out there it's just take what you want that works yeah, for you exactly bruce lee was always a really good advocate for that yeah. he was saying you know create your own storyline or create your own path take what you need from everyone else and leave the rest yeah because, I've, yeah. I've done a little bit of going down the Buddhist path because I did, you know, obviously quite a peaceful religion except for in uh, Myanmar, um, yeah. you know, meditation focused, that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I've, I've been to a fair few live talks, particularly from Western monks. I find, you know, I've, I've listened to some of the Tibetan Buddhist monks and I find I, I kind of don't feel as involved when it's through a translator. Yeah. But the Western guys really know how to target their Western audience. and. Yeah. I caught up with one guy after a show and I just, I just asked him, mate, like, look, I'm, I love a lot of what I'm hearing, but I, I really, I don't believe in the magical stuff. I'm not about reincarnation. He's like, that's cool, mate. Put reincarnation back. Yep. It's just like you said, as yep. you know, like take what little bits and snippets. Like, we, don't, we don't need you to buy into the whole picture. We don't need you to buy into an all powerful creator in the sky. We don't need you to buy into anything. Just, this is what we're doing, you know, and whatever helps you from Buddhism, grab that, you know, that's, that's all we want. Yeah. And I think even Bruce Lee, I, was, I remember him saying a quote once, and there might even be a show out now kind of based on a phrase that he had was like, be like water. Yeah. You know, water can take the shape of any container that you put it in. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what shape it is or when it's left alone, it levels out. I mean, it's a great, yep. it's a great sort of mantra, I guess. Mm. Not one to live by like all the others, but yeah, take what you need from yep. anything and, and make your own path because mm. allowing yourself to do that, you're making... You're not living by other people's rules. If you're living someone else's way, word for word, you're living their way. Yep. And you've got to do it your own. Yeah, absolutely. Your own sanity because everyone's situation yep. is different. You know, you can't compare yourself to a an ultra runner or a mega athlete who is single and isn't married and competing all these things. He's in his early twenties to someone that's in their you know mid to mid thirties with a family and a full time job. So yeah. It's all different and everyone's yeah. got their own way of getting across it. So I think yeah. one big thing though is it doesn't matter who you are, everyone needs some sort of self care routine now. Absolutely. You know, and I know if you've got kids or work's busy or stressful, whatever, you know, your time poor, it doesn't matter. It, I, th I really believe everyone needs to be doing something in that in that scope now, you know, to, to be looking after themselves. Well, in talk of taking up people's time and living the busy life, um, I reckon we've covered it really well, man. Like it's been a great chat. I don't want to keep you too long. You're up here on holidays, and I'm I'm grateful of the time you've already given me. Man, that's right. This once, morning, man. Once we so. sign off, I'm probably just going to hang out with you anyway. So, yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but look, man, thanks for coming in. Um, I know we did do this earlier in the year, and you know there are a few little hiccups that sort of stopped it from happening back then. But I'm so glad we sort of rescheduled, and I got you in live. And I think this episode just went so much better for that. Yeah, reason. awesome, man. No. Glad to sit down with you. Covered heaps more, man. So thanks a lot for coming in. And yeah, look forward to sharing some trails this week and going let's from do it. there. Yeah. Wicked. All right. Let's train. Let's move. Let's stretch. Let's breathe. Tap into let's some do it all. good stuff we're talking about. Sounds good. Awesome. Thanks, bro. All righty. 
What did you guys think about that one? Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, as I said before and during the episode, I had Strunk on a while ago to record something um, over the airwaves, but it didn't work out. <laughs> he was actually doing renovations in his house and there was a bit of background noise and it just didn't really sound super great. So, uh, But on the plus side of that, he's in town and we managed to, to lock down an episode, which is epic to see him in person and to have a, a better live discussion so I think it worked out a lot better uh, and we got to explore a bit more in depth into some of the topics and it's always better when you can have someone face to face to talk to as well so super stoked he could be here and to come on the show um, you know I've always admired Andrew since I've met him look up to him he's just such a fit positive person and he always puts everything he has into whatever he does, but obviously over the years he's learnt to give himself that opportunity to be um, that best version of himself possible, which um, is just a great person to be around and just being in his presence and hanging out um, is just such a great experience and a great vibe. So I hope you guys got an idea of that through the episode. Um, Obviously he does great work with whatever he does um, and the Backpacker Medics. If you want to check them out, check them out at www.backpackermedics.org. Uh, and if you want to donate to the cause, which I'm sure you will once you've heard a bit more of their story, it's such a great cause for what these guys are doing. They're really putting themselves out there to give medical supplies and support to people that need it where they probably would never normally get it because they're, you know, they're, they're pretty remote and out the way of, of the areas that really need it. So make sure you check them out and donate. Uh, on the socials as well for them, they're on Instagram, just at Backpacker Medics. You'll find them there and you'll see photos of Andrew and all the crew doing amazing work. Um, with what they do so please check them out but yeah on the back side of that obviously we talk about how he recovers from all of these things I mean I've seen Andrew at weddings and social gatherings with friends where there's a lot of people and he's just come off the back of a of a pretty brutal and big shift away um, dealing with these emergencies uh, and he's left pretty much on a pretty short notice thing as well obviously emergencies happen short notice and he's got to pack up from work and then head out there so it's a big thing for him to put himself out there and also coming home I mean like I've seen him at a wedding two days after he's flown in from a pretty big event so um, knowing what he needs to do to give himself time to get right and to be available and to be that person is just um, such good learnings um, and I really um have also got a lot out of that as well so listen i hope you guys have enjoyed it Um, i always enjoy talking to you guys if you're tuning in again really appreciate you tuning in Um, i appreciate all of my listeners and if you're tuning for the first time i really hope you like this episode don't be shy to shout it out to your friends give us a mention on the on the gram on the ig at the inner expeditions podcast Um, and don't forget we're across all platforms with spotify google podcast and apple podcast as well so give us a shout out share it out there sing it out to your friends everywhere to let them know that uh, if you're enjoying the podcast to please let other people know but otherwise look hey it's been great having you all again i always enjoy talking to everyone i hope you enjoy listening to me if there's anything you like or anything you want to hear more of or anything in general please just send me a dm on the gram i'll always listen and reply so please do that otherwise i'll leave you guys to it I hope you have a great time. I hope you're enjoying doing whatever you're doing right now. Please get back in there. Enjoy. And I look forward to speaking to you guys again real soon with another great guest. See you later. Bye.